computer. Okay, cool. So I'll kick this off with, uh, as I will every week, um, basically uh, a brief little slide set to get us uh, kind of in the uh, right mind frame, so full screen mode. Um, there we go. Into the kind of like the right mind frame when uh, going through some of these more applied tutorials. Uh, you guys will probably have a good intuition about some of this material uh, just from the class lectures. Uh, before all that, though, I'm going to start with a disclaimer. My hopes are to basically publicly uh, post all these recordings. So the real goal here is as good as the 100-page machine learning textbook is, um, it's always convenient to have, I guess, what these tutorials are, like the more applied, hands-on uh, side to things. So I am planning on publicly posting these. Uh, I think we are allowed to, or at least in the... Um, in the syllabus, I think it states that uh, we can. Um, and But for that reason, I'm also going to put these disclaimers up just to make sure that uh, at the end of the day, privacy is preserved. So what I will do, the easy bits for me, is I'm going to keep everyone's videos uh, off screen. I'll also address names in the chat. So if ever you have questions or anything uh, and I call on you by name, I'll do first name only. Uh, and you, what I ask of you guys then would be to stay muted and ask the questions in the chat. Although I do encourage unmuted, so this like little footnote, unmuted or voice-based questions, but just know that that's not explicitly privacy pre preserving. Um, I guess a bit more uh, specifically, if you feel that this hinders your ability to learn as part of these lectures and it violates your privacy, so um, you, don't, you don't necessarily want to have these things posted publicly, um, just let me or Dr. Green know. Uh, we'll like modify the videos and everything accordingly. But yeah, if uh, everyone's cool and kosher with that, um, I hope to basically have a fun kind of YouTube series, like a playlist of every week's material as we make our way through the, the textbook. So I'll start kicking this off with what I had introduced last week, this uh, idea of ML Weekly, just introduce you to some of the kind of ongoing things uh, in the machine learning community. Um, I'm also going to classify these maybe by like types of machine learning that they are. So in the NLP side, uh, so I think one or two days ago, um, Facebook AI researchers basically are putting together this kind of interactive online framework where you you basically are trying to identify um, like you're you're basically combating the ML algorithm, the language model, to try and find points of weakness. So uh, the fun title to this uh, article, yeah, is this. Go ahead, try to sneak bad words past these AI filters. So um, Dynabench is basically what they've built. So it's kind of like this interactive way to kind of benchmark uh, natural language processing algorithms for tasks that are predominantly difficult or that uh, they would typically fail in. Um, things like, uh, I can click on this. Uh, there's a few different tasks. So here, uh, question answering, I'm trying to classify what is hate speech or sentiment analysis. Anyways. Um, for those who are more kind of with a NLP leaning, this could be a potential interest. Um, one that apparently was first introduced at NeurIPS, one of the leading uh, machine learning conferences uh, in, in machine learning. Um, in 2018, they first introduced this robot that could play curling. <laughs> and actually yesterday, they just published a uh, science robotics paper where uh, apparently now uh, it has human level performance. So it was actually able to beat, I think it was a Korean team. For those who uh, are Canadian and ML researchers, this is a particularly interesting application of how uh, basically building an AI in this kind of turn-based game, kind of like chess or checkers or um, uh, other types of like rural turn based games, but in an actual physical environment where the conditions will actually change. So kind of interesting from more of the robotics branch of research. Um, from vision, so these are two, I only bring these ones up because uh, I'm actually coming up with a few different potential research avenues that kind of build off some of these ideas more in the computer vision side of things. So in 2016, um, for those who may know the game GeoGuessr, you're basically presented Google Street View at some part of the world that you can explore around and your job is to guess where you are and you try to be as close as possible. Um, Planet, basically a, uh, um, a computer vision algorithm devised by, or developed by Google using it was millions of geotagged photos, uh, did particularly well. They kind of solved this as well. Um, and something kind of similar in that vein, different ways of using Google Street View uh, imagery 
for uh, different types of applications. So this is more of a GAN application for those who might be familiar with the idea of style transfer. Um, this is one that's particularly interesting. Basically collect photographs of, um, so a, a given photographer who goes out with a professional camera and lots of Photoshop skills um, we'll take pictures of locations and if those are geotagged you can go and find the street view of those locations as well And then using again basically learn a transform that allows you to take what would be this input Google Street View image and have it kind of stylized as if a professional photographer had done it So um, I'm also working kind of similar. I'm trying to devise a, a project that's kind of similar in this way that might be more in the uh, research or um, real estate business so it's you think of whenever you want to sell a house you want to kind of get it professionally photographed and whatnot if you could collect a bunch of those kind of professional exterior of your house photographs and you have the google street view image of it can you learn a transform uh that allows you to basically take any house anywhere on google street view and have it kind of stylized as if for sale um, might put the photographers out of business but um yeah, it's anyways, it's, a, it's an interesting application. So that's kind of the latest and greatest in ML Weekly. Um, so now I'll jump into kind of uh, building up an intuition for what the two topics we're gonna cover in today's course or t tutorial will be. Um, for those who haven't already done so, um, I'd recommend uh, just getting these notebooks spun up. I'm actually going to be using Google Colab today. Uh, to do this, I figure uh, there's no real reason why I should stick to one or the other in this way um, If collab is easier for some um, I'll be able to spin these up So tutorial three is the one that we're going to kind of build off of and work through and Tutorial two is the one this one was the one that we kind of briefly touched at the end of last uh, Last time if we have time, I'll go through this a bit more specifically, but this one's really well written out I, I recommend uh, if you haven't already to kind of just like read through, um, run the cells, just kind of get a good understanding for it. If we have time, um, I'll walk you guys through that as well. Any questions at any point in time, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, hi, there's currently, oh, people in the lobby, thank you. Yeah, I need to perhaps figure out how to auto add admit all. Okay, great. thank you. Uh, for those who are just joining, I'll keep, uh, yeah, I'll keep that window open. Okay, good. I think that's everybody in for now. Option and security. Okay, thanks, Josh. What I'll do is um, I'll just kind of auto add everyone in now. And okay, yeah, good. I took off the waiting room. So anybody who joins now, the waiting room is disabled. Cool. All right. Thank you. All right. So moving on. Um, what I'm yeah. What I'm going to do here is basically just build up the intuition behind um, basically the the topics of this tutorial, which are decision trees, uh, SVMs, k-nearest neighbors. And to start that off, I'm gonna just use a kind of like a toy example. If you're given data, in this case, just these like points on what looks to be like a one-dimensional line, um, and we're gonna do this in one dimension because it's kind of just the basic simplest form, um, but know that each of these things can kind of be uh, cast into higher dimensions, two dimensions, three, and so forth. They just become harder to visualize in the intuition the intuition will build in one dimensions should hopefully become obvious in two, three, and, and so on. So the idea here is we would have a certain vector of values um, along this number line where this first blue point has a value of 0.12 uh, and a class label, the, the coloring here is defining class of zero. And as we go along this line, we have other, uh, other data points, other numbers, and we have uh, other class labels, in this case, one. Um, for the sake of convenience and something that will often be the case in machine learning applications, you want to try and have values that fall within some sort of normalized or scaled range. So in this case, you can see that they nicely fall within this um, float valued range between uh, one and zero and one. Um, and we'll kind of show that to be the case when we're transforming other data in the tutorials. So if we want to figure out how would we classify a new point so we can think of while we're in one dimensions here, a two dimensional being dropping this new point into that number line, um, how would we classify it? And just intuitively, when we look at this, we would think, well, there's a decision boundary that we could sit right here between um, these two points. Why did we choose it at this point and not any other? Um, at least to us, you know, looking at this problem or figuring it out, this would clearly seem to minimize any errors when you're adding new points 
to try and you know classify them into what we would expect to be the correct class. So in this case, um, a concept here is something like the margin. We want to kind of like maximize uh, that margin. We want to identify a point between the two that's kind of figured out um, to be uh, to be as wide as possible or as distanced from any two points of different classes, uh, because in theory we would think that that would be that would make the most sense. Um, there's no reason why we would necessarily want to press it right up against this blue point or right up against this other pink point. Um, so intuitively, at least I hope it feels like that that makes sense and that that's what algorithms are trying to do. They're trying to figure that out uh, automatically without us having to kind of look at the data and do it ourselves. And when you think of that margin, you can also think that the confidence you have in classifying a different point might uh, increase or decrease based on how far any new point is relative to that margin. So when we kind of look at this here, color is just kind of capturing confidence. So if we were dropping a new point instead of here in kind of this like third blue band, uh, but closer to the margin, we might have an intuition that maybe we're less confident um, in that point. But in essence, maybe you've come to look at this as, hmm, this looks an awful lot like something like an SVM might be trying to do. The other way that you can consider these things, though, is just pure like binary, right? We have a decision boundary, and if it falls to the left, we call it blue. If it falls to the right, we call it pink and, and class one and, and call it a day at that. Um, so this is kind of like an if-else statement, right? So it's like you're taking a decision. A new point comes in, whatever its x value is, we've learned this boundary to be, I don't know, somewhere around point, you know, 0.61 or whatever it is. If it's less than 0.61, call it class zero. If it's more, call it class one. Um, makes, at least from a binary decision standpoint, a pretty easy model or, or rule. Um, but what happens when those things are no longer linearly separable? And by linearly separable, we literally mean can we draw, in this case, it, I'm representing the decision boundary as a line, but understand that it's actually a point, right? It's a single value. So while we're in one dimension, we have a zero dimensional um, point. And if we go into 2D, we're, we're drawing a line through. So something just to conceptualize is your decision boundaries are ways to partition space. And we're trying to partition space by applying basically um, some kind of uh, plane or point in this case, plane or line in two dimensions and then plane in three dimensions. And as you increase the number of dimensionality, it's like hyperplanes. Um, and the idea is that's always going to be one dimension less than the dimensionality of your data. So on a one dimensional line, it's a zero dimensional point. Um, two dimensions, it's a one dimensional line. We'll, we'll kind of cast this up into two dimensions uh, at the end. But yeah, linearly separable in this sense, or at least in this case, is can we define a specific point that perfectly separates the data? In this case, I've uh, modified the data slightly. So we actually have you know, these two other points that now lie on either sides of what we would normally have called our decision boundary. So now in this case, we can have something maybe a bit more um, uh, sophisticated. We want to come up with a model that will capture that. Kayan asks, you said the decision boundary will always be one dimension less than the, the data. Yeah. Well, maybe not in all cases, but what we're doing right now is a class of um, kind of the classical machine learning algorithms. So uh, at least in these cases and in these examples, yes. Um, hope that answers. Yeah, no worries. Cool. So we can now think of maybe partitioning space in a slightly more complex way. If we're going to go off of this idea that we had before of, you know, just like binary, is it on either sides of these things, we might be a bit more um, complex in how we develop that model. So uh, we can ask, does it reside to the left or right of this line? Does it then reside to the left or right of this line? And then does it reside to the left or right of these? And, and you kind of like go down in this kind of like nested um, if else question to partition space in this way. So if we added a new point um, and we and it falls on either sides of those uh, those lines, then we're basically uh, classifying with whatever the kind of terminal leaf of that decision tree is. Um, I'm hoping the idea here that having these kind of like nested if else statements gives a good intuition that it's just a fan a decision tree is just a fancy set of if else conditions on, at least in this case, the one dimensional data. So while interesting to approach it in that way, is there another way that we could do this? Is there another way that we can partition space 
where new points, as they're being added in, um, are defined by other uh, factors other than just, you know, these uh, numerical uh, points or like um, cutoffs along the number line. So one other idea in the last class that we're going to be looking at today is maybe to think of a more instance-based type method. So in this case, what we would do is look, uh, as we're adding new points, at what are the three nearest neighbors to where that new point is expected to be? And from that, can we gain some confidence in what that new point should be? So in, in this leftmost case, we looked at as this new point is being dropped down into the number line, we're looking at the three nearest points to it. They're all class zero. Um, so by a voting strategy, so I might just throw this out. Why would we want to consider odd number only um, values? So three, five, or seven. So the, yeah, so Josh says no, no ties, exactly. So obviously if we had a four nearest neighbors and two say class one, two say class two, um, or class zero, uh, it wouldn't, really help us, we'd just be stuck with another problem of how do we, how do we break ties. So by considering uh, only odd numbers, we at least have a definitive way to, uh, to partition uh, or to basically uh, classify the points by vote or by consensus. And you can also think, so when we look at these other two, it also gives us a certain sense of, again, confidence in that classification. So in the middle point, um, while two of them are uh, blue, one of them is pink, we might be less confident in how we're classifying that point as we might have been for this leftmost one. And the same goes for uh, this other one on the other side. So now instead of kind of dynamic or partitioning space into these uh, specific classed segments, um, we're really just looking at where are the data or how are the data distributed around uh, or proximal to these, these new data points. And so we can obviously, what I've done here is basically lifted this out of the one dimension and into two. So what I do is I also keep these kind of like axes here. These are basically like projections. So when you think of um, taking this data and casting it into um, each of these different uh, lower dimensional spaces, um, you can clearly see this one's kind of like all clustered up. It's like you take each point and uh, as you cast it down, there's no real definitive way that we can potentially partition this lower dimensional space, but by considering a higher dimensional space, we actually see that where this was once uh, non-linearly separable in this one dimensional line down here, then uh, in this case, clearly in higher dimensions, uh, it does become linearly separable. Um, and so the concept of machine learning really is, so while we get a good intuition for how these things might operate in kind of lower dimensions, the idea is always to, um, Sorry, there's a question. Uh, where do we get the Y data from? Is it related to the X data? So the Y, the y value is literally just the class. So it's, it's also, we can relate here to coloring, right? It's just, um, this is all like simulated. So this is just for the sake of, um, of uh, an example to show how data might be distributed. So the vertical axis, yeah. So take, uh, so take this point here. Um, all, all I'm doing is kind of adding in another layer of simulated data. So it's like this guy, whoops. This guy here, when you cast them back, shows up here. These kind of three points here all collapse down to here. This pink one here collapses down. So it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I made, I made a, this all up just simply for the sake of, uh, of argument. Okay, so yeah, so the idea here is just to show that by considering other dimensions of data, so here we're looking now at a plane, uh, we can see that there is in fact a linearly separable line through here. So kind of in the exact same way as we had partitioned the number line using a few different strategies, this line now in two dimensions is, is kind of the same as figuring out that linearly separable cut point, right? But instead of it being a single point in one dimension, it's now a line that we're going to try and like figure out where it resides in two. Um, and then you can imagine as you take this up to three dimensions, so if I was to pull this entire data set kind of out of the screen as well, they might form, you know, clusters in three dimension that you might take a slice through that plane to figure out um, a given decision boundary. So all of this to say, today what we're going to be doing is basically comparing classical machine learning algorithms. And classical really is in the sense that these were devised in kind of the early days of um, pattern recognition and, and uh, kind of more automated statistical methods. So this is all through like the, the, the 
20th century, right? So like in the 1960s and 70s, a lot of these and 80s, a lot of these things were kind of developed and was considered, you know, state of the art then, but are just as useful today when your problem spaces uh, require them. Is there some way to figure out how many dimensions we need to go find linearly separable plane or is just increase as needed? Well, I mean, that's again, dependent on your data, right? Um, the hope is that you can have data that is linearly separable because, I mean, it just means that your models will be um, most performant. Like the goal here is always to try and find a model that will perform best, but also hopefully generalizable. Um, there's a curse of dimensionality, which is a bit more um, uh, longer term or uh, a bit more complex in kind of what it, it means. But at the end of the day, it just means that as you increase dimensionality, uh, your data becomes increasingly more sparse. So there is a bit of a trade off. Like you can always, um, you can always hopefully find greater dimensions to get linear separability, but you may not necessarily have a generalizable uh, model for, for any new data. But anyways, the, the kind of key insight that I, I just want to introduce here before we dig into the, um, the actual uh, code is basically you don't want to always think that there's a one, you know, one model that rules them all. There's no like real silver bullet um, that will solve all your problems. And, and that's kind of like the joke here and like the whole purpose behind this like background really is uh, if your data doesn't require these super complex and, uh, you know, uh, computationally taxing methods and you could actually get away with a much simpler kind of like Occam's razor, uh, you want to uh, be parsimonious in the way that you're, uh, you're choosing and designing your, your models, um, you really don't need to like, you know, rent this major truck to move this little uh, toy vehicle, right? So it's, you want to, it's, it's, while we're comparing algorithms, it's a matter of figuring out kind of which one, which of these tools is the best uh, that suits the task. So uh, without further ado, let's jump into the actual notebooks and I'll cover some of these topics a bit more um, in detail as we're making our way through those. Uh, if anyone has any questions or anything's unclear as of now, feel free to throw questions in. And if not, um, we'll start working through this first one. So this, uh, again, tutorial three, if you don't know where it is, um, it's in uh, Dr. Green's uh, course um, GitHub. So you can grab it from there. Uh, really what this one we're going to do, so the idea here, um, we want to look at the distribution of our data because that might help inform which models might make more sense in different cases. So um, here we, what we want to do is we want to see how various algorithms learn and apply their decision boundaries. Another kind of analogy or um, kind of uh, in similar vein to this uh, image here, a landscaper has various tools that they can use for moving dirt. This can be a trowel, a shovel, backhoe, excavator, going find, from like small amount of dirt to extremely large amounts of dirt but with no specific problem in mind you might say that the excavator is the best always um, because it's able to move the largest volume in the shortest amount of time but if we show up to a job with our exca excavator excavator ready to go but the job is to plant tulips well we probably wish we'd have picked a more reasonable tool uh, than than the ex excavator right so um so we would want to figure out how is our data distributed Oops. Um, and then instead of reaching for the most computation expensive complex, like catch all method, neural networks, deep neural networks and the likes, um, it might make more sense to kind of stick with a more classic and traditional algorithm. There's also this method in, or this, um, this theorem in machine learning that, uh, called the no free lunch theorem, uh, back in, I think it was 97, if you, for those who want to kind of dig more into the math. Um, it states that any two optimization algorithms are equivalent when their performance is averaged across all problems. So if you have like the best cat dog detector, um, that's really good for that one task. Uh, it, it means that that while it's particularly good for that ex very, like very specific task, if you try to apply it to any other task where other models are more specific, it probably won't do so well because there's no cats or dogs. The idea here is again, fitting the right, um, tool to, to the task. So here what we'll do is we'll play around with a few different types of data that are distributed in different ways and we'll also look uh, at a few different models. So here logistic regression was the one we kind of ended on last week. We'll look at decision trees, linear SVMs, 
SVMs that are nonlinear, so instead of uh, considering always straight lines, um, they allow for more, more contours and then k-nearest neighbors. So for those who don't have too much familiar with scikit-learn, it's kind of the like de facto go-to um, for building these things. So all that we do in this first cell is just kind of load up all the things that we're gonna need. Um, and then we're also gonna generate a bunch of synthetic data. So there are these kind of like toy distributions that machine learning researchers will use to kind of test out algorithms um, in different ways. So the, the moon's distribution is basically kind of like a two moon pattern. So these are uh, non-linear and uh, somewhat overlapping. And these are all in uh, 2D, by the way. Um, that's why I kind of want to build up the intuition in kind of one dimension and then introduce things in two. The circles distribution is just two concentric circles, one that's approximately linearly separable. So they're kind of auto-generated around it in approximately linear separable manner. And then to that one, we'll add basically noise to make it kind of like less linearly separable. And, and these are ways to do that. So, so from scikit-learn, one of the things here, the scikit-learn data set, have these functions, make moon, make circle, and so on. So if you ever want to kind of like try your own ideas or just auto-generate data to test out other types of models, these are really good to work from. Uh, so all that these do is um, you can like kind of control things for like noise and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, this is just gonna make the moon's data set, make the circle's data set. I'll uh, run this and actually show you guys. So what I'll do here, I commented this one out because I don't want to always show it, but I want to show you that these end up as like uh, these tuple classes and the number of points that they generate is 100. And just to give you a sense of what that looks like, because these are two-dimensional data, um, as, a, as a two tuple, the first tuple that they have is basically a list of lists. So here um, there's 100 points, right? Points being defined as uh, two, uh, val like two coordinate values. And then there's the set, so these are like your, as we described before, your X's, similar uh, to this, right? Um, it's not exactly as represented here, but basically every point in this plane is defined by two values. There's a hundred of them. And then the second value in that tuple is an array of uh, size 100, where it's just gonna assign a class depending on those points. Um, skipping kind of ahead, it looks something like this. So the moon's data set is kind of these two uh, kind of arch, overlapped arch type data sets. Um, the circles are concentric circles. So again, with a certain amount of noise generated around their periphery. This one is linearly separable, maybe not obvious to tell right here right now, but there is a separating um, plane that can be drawn through this. And then by adding noise to this, basically just like a uniform jitter of noise, um, we just get an, an alternative, uh, more overlapping data set. So again, that's kind of so no question so far. I hope this is all clear. Um, that's basically what's, what's happening here. So this make classification is our third data set. So uh, we're just saying we want uh, two features. So like, uh, you know, two values for your X's. Um, yeah. Separating classes, number of clusters per class and so on and so forth. Basically it's just a way to like, you can create um, multiple types of data sets in like higher dimensional spaces. So whenever you want to kind of synth synthetically create data, you can toy around with these, uh, with these parameters. Uh, and then the same way uh, here, when we're applying this uniform random amount of uh, kind of jitter to all those points, we're basically just saying, take all the original data, um, add one value, and, or well, add some amount of this uniform jitter to each of those points. And then what we're doing is we're creating this non-linearly like, um, noisy linearly separable data set by just using those new kind of jittered points and and the y and you can see these all follow uh the same shape they're all two tuples they are all 100 points with x's and y values if you have a model that has a lot of noise then would the feature be considered to be a bad one to use for classification yeah so so i mean this this gets into something that's uh feature uh, selection, so kind of something we touched on last week, and the idea there is you want to really only consider uh, kind of useful data. So actually, if we had to pick between one of these two, so we call this, say, uh, x2, call this one x1, 
I hope it's obvious that we would prefer, in this case, x1. I, I don't know if I called this one x1 or x2. Anyways, the slower one. Um, because of the like little overlap between the distributions. When we look at this and you cast this down, and project it onto this axis, uh, it's not a very useful feature on its own, but when combined together, they are very useful. So um, even if one axis is noisy to some extent, the, com the combination of multiple features might actually make for more uh, reasonable distributions. I hope that answers your question. Um, like you can have bad features, but the idea of machine learning and kind of considering higher dimensional um, spaces is yeah, basically to use them in combination to actually come up with something that's hopefully useful and generalizable. So that's basically the data. So that will be, these are like the, the hundred data sets or the, um, data sets of 100 points that we'll use uh, as we go forward. So here, all that I'm doing is uh, kind of gathering them up together. This way, that the way that they're wrapped up in this way allows us to kind of like iterate through, just makes the code a little cleaner. Um, so instead of having to kind of like plot these out one by one, I'm just, in this case, going to iterate over um, each instance within these data sets. So starting on the moon's data set, then the circles and so on and so forth. And then all that we're doing is, is plotting them. So uh, I think last, I had to adopt this from last year. I don't like when things are too verbose. If you have the opportunity to kind of like cycle through or loop something, um, it's a bit more elegant. So, so that's what this is. And also just to note, every time you run this, it's going to be a new data set. So this actually might be slightly different than the last time that I had run it, which actually might mean that the experiments that we do later, interpretations might change very slightly um, because these are all kind of like regenerated and jittered and, and new. It, it's also convenient because it allows you to kind of like, well, you'll see later, um, I invite those who are really curious to kind of like try and use that as a means of kind of testing the statistical significance of these data sets. But um, yeah, that's gonna come a little later. So the idea here, no questions, good. Okay, so the idea here then um, is uh, the two top distributions are generated from nonlinear functions. I hope that's clear here because you can tell that they're, um, they're basically drawn from uh, these like curved type in the case of a circle. I mean, they're, they're drawn from a, a circle's um, value. You'd also want to note that the bottom two are uh, kind of generated on what is more like a linearly separable boundary. And again, the only difference between the two is just how much overlap uh, they share in the plane. So what, do we, what does this kind of tell us we should expect? We would expect that a linear type classifier would probably perform poorly on the top two data sets um, if they're using kind of like linear based methods to divvy up or partition the space, but they might do better in uh, these linearly separable cases. For those that are uh, nonlinear in, in the way that they are, uh, they like define their decision boundaries, are expected to, to do better on these two top like nonlinear data sets, but we'd also expect them to do well in the linearly separable case. Um, when they're non-linear, you can always apply those methods to the linear case in a like more uh, tri trivialized fashion. But they might also be more complex. So if your data are linearly separable, it's sometimes much more computationally efficient to use linear-based methods than again using that like really complex tool um, for a more trivial task. So again. Um, these are the classifiers we're going to look at, and it's, again, really straightforward to actually create them. Um, one thing that I will emphasize absolutely is to always go and look at the documentation. So each of these I made as a link to um, their, uh, their specific, like, scikit-learn methods. Um, so here, for example, uh, there's, like, support vector classification. You want to look at, like, different types of things, like the kernel can be made linear, it can be made uh, polynomial. Um, this is one that we'll use too, a radial basis function, um, and so on and so forth. And you can look at like, these are all what are then known as like the hyperparameters. Okay, KN asks, so from the top two graphs, it might help to consider a third feature that would allow us, yeah, to be linearly separable in the data. Exactly. So the idea here is if, um, 
for the circles data set as an example, if you're able to kind of like lift that into three dimension where all of those on the inner circle kind of cluster into one point and those in the outer circle are, uh, are clustered or like separated in another part of the three dimensional space, then it does become linearly separable. Um, the textbook or like the 100 page notebook actually has an example of that. I believe that you guys would have read. Um, yeah, dealing with inherent non-linearity, check out figure 3.6. I don't know if like, oh yeah, that's not gonna work. Anyways, figure 3.6 in the, the, the book. You can see kind of how uh, inherent non-linearities are made uh, linear by considering higher dimensional space. So back to, anyways, these, yeah. So just take a look at these um, hyperparameters. Again, a big, what if there's no feature that helps us separate the data? Um, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, uh, the million dollar question. If you don't have any additional information to leverage, um, really all that you have then is models that will not be, in this case, like perfect. Or you try to come up with uh, a model that will perform as well as possible, um, but may not actually, you know, um, perfectly separate uh, or perfectly partition the space. But the hopes is that that model and the idea of trying to be like superhuman in some sense, if that model is better than um, what human performance might be, or it automates a task that uh, humans don't want to do, or that you you know need to do like millions, billions of times, that's still a useful model. Um, while we try to pursue things like linear separability just because it, it kind of uh, makes like the, the perfect model, um, it's not always possible. If you can find additional data that might help the problem improve um, or by like considering different combinations of features and, and the likes, then you actually can perhaps generate a better model. That's like literally the art part that is uh, like the art and science of machine learning. So what kind of features are we talking about? Yeah, okay, so um, I'm, I'm always trying to keep this like a little bit abstract in, uh, in the way that I represent things just because then it, it applies to everything. You could think of this uh, as, well, if we're gonna talk about the, um, the uh, tulip data set, you could think of this as like sepal length and sepal width or um, any other kind of numeric description of the data. This could be if we're trying to classify an overhead camera on like a fish sorter to figure out what kind of fish this is and you're taking like pictures of the color of the fish, this could be some representation of like color. So this could be like these tend to be lighter and these tend to be darker or, or vice versa. Um, it could be like length of fish if you're some way that you can use like machine processing or uh, machine uh, vision to kind of like measure the length of the fish, this could be length. These are also cast back into this like um, zero one uh, float domain just because normalized data tends to uh, be preferred in models and it's it's like a pre-processing that you'll want to do. But the idea is you can literally think of these uh, values as like representing anything. Um, and that's again the big importance to kind of visualizing your data. Um, whenever you uh, arrive at kind of like this type of visualization, so again these are data points that could represent kind of anything distributed um, in two, two domains and you see so like all of these ones on the outside these are all the salmon or certain type of tulip all those in the middle are another type of bass or another type of tulip and so on and so forth you want to figure out how do I partition this domain so whenever I whenever I see a new fish I want to figure out whether it's um, bass or or salmon and if it's uh, you know a, a tulip it can be anything else so Really, it's like by keeping it somewhat abstract, I hope that you can get, gain some kind of like intuition as to how this can relate to many types of problems. Say, for example, this linearly separable one, this bottom axis is length, then these things are shorter and these things are longer, right? And if you talk like height, um, things that are, you know, things that are on the lower end are, are shorter and these ones are taller, um, just to give kind of some example. I don't have like really good uh, examples, but um, if you look at the data here, so sepal length in centimeters, sepal width in centimeters, these are values that um, when plotted will form different types of distributions, right? And those come from like a very real thing, which is like, again, the measurement of these things. So 
Um, let's get back then to here. So after you've kind of like looked at all these, what we're going to do is just like make five uh, different classifiers. So here, a logistic regression one, um, a decision tree. Here we're going to cap the maximum depth that we grow the tree to like kind of five levels. Um, you can imagine like they can become absolutely massive. You let them grow to be like hundreds long. Um, something that might be interesting for you guys to think about what happens when uh, the number of leaf nodes in your decision tree is the same size or the same number as your data, uh, like the input data that you're, you're training on. Um, it's an interesting thing to, to think about. Um, similarly, um, we'll have here, these are the two SVM. So this one, this first one is linear. This C value is the penalty parameter for uh, misclassified points. Something that I always like to do whenever I'm kind of using a new model or toying with it, I like to kind of just leave myself notes uh, in large part like pulled from the documentation just because these are the types of things that you might like want to modify or, or tune or tweak to try and get a, an improved model. This is our radial basis function SVM, so the like nonlinear variant that's going to look at making more um, like Gaussian like distributions like they're, they're not going to consider kind of like straight cuts through um, the different planes but in fact uh, build zones of confidence around um, data in a in this like nonlinear way and then the KNN classifier so again as in the example in the slides we're just going to look at like the three closest neighbors and see how uh, how uh, we classify points based on those so again it's pretty straightforward to put these together. And now we get into like the real uh, heart of this. We have four data sets and five different classifiers. So what we're actually going to be doing is comparing 20 different things, right? Um, each of those four applied to each of those five or each of the five classifiers applied to each of the four data sets. As we had done kind of before, we're just going to randomly split um, uh, the data into like 70 percent for training and 30 percent for testing because we have 100 points it's actually pretty uh, easy to calculate how many things we get like right or wrong um, we know that 70 because we generated 100 points we know 70 are being used to train um, and any errors we make on the 30 uh, we can we can figure out uh, you know how many they got right or wrong uh, because we know that there's 30 data points so uh, this is where things get really fun. Um, these are basically just like useful plotting variables to kind of make the uh, massive grid of comparisons. And then all we're doing is iterating through each data set. Uh, this here, the standard scalar, this is kind of that idea of trying to um, uh, normalize the data into uh, a format that is usually a bit more uh, amenable to um, different machine learning algorithms. So a standard scalar here, this one will remove the mean uh, and divide by the, uh, by the variance of the data. There's others that you can consider like min max normalization and the likes. Um, basically, uh, different types of normalization factors will have different effects, but it's usually a good idea to normalize your data first. Then this is a very handy function, again, from scikit-learn that will um, basically like separate the data into um, the different data sets that you need. So we need the features, those like paired points uh, to train and then withhold a number of those uh, to test and then also the Y value. So these Ys, these are the class labels that will be used with the training set to kind of partition the space. And then when we test it, when we give the model these uh, X values, these points that we withheld, we can evaluate how correct the model is by uh, comparing it with the Y from the Y values, the actual labels from the test. Um, here, all we do is we set up a bunch of, uh, so here and here, this is basically just like setting up the grids. What we need to also do, um, yeah, so well, anyways, I'll give you guys a sense of what this looks like. We're basically just setting up this entire thing. And here's where we iterate over each model. And something that we want to do is we want to also color the uh, space using the confidence uh, of the classifier in each of those, those spaces. So what these like XX uh, ravels, what these basically do is it just allows us to kind of like iterate over the entire space and apply um, 
some confidence as to uh, where what it, it would color that space to be. It's the same kind of thing that I wanted to do kind of like here, right? You want to, uh, based on the probability of uh, each point in the plane, get some measure of uh, how confident the, the model is. So that's kind of what's captured in this middle bit. And then all that we're doing thereafter uh, is basically adding all the training points and then the um, test points are actually gonna, with this like alpha parameter, this is just like um, how transparent they are. We make them a little bit uh, more transparent so that we can actually see um, which of those data points are in fact uh, used in, as part of the test set. So when I run this, again, this is gonna be new data and new partitions. What we're looking on here is each row is one data set, right? So this is the moon's data set, just kind of represented uh, in a different way. And you can see the somewhat slightly lighter points are those that are the test and the completely dark ones are the ones that were used to train. So what we're doing then is we're looking across the, each row is one data set and then we're comparing for each of those, the outcomes of each of the, um, of the, the models. So in this case, logistic regression, this gives us a sense that uh, it's as a, again, linear type thing, the more kind of to the upper left that you are, the higher confidence the model is in that it is in fact red. In the bottom of each as well, I'm leaving uh, accuracy. So this is how many instances it got correct, it, cla it correctly classified. Yeah, so what are the numbers? So this is, this is accuracy. So for example here, this is what your decision tree does. So you can see that these are kind of like straight lines cutting, trying to like partition the plane again into uh, these like if else type statements. So if the, if the new point falls to the left of this line here, like you can imagine all that those partitioned spaces just like the outcomes of a tree, it will classify as red. If not, it will classify as blue. And so you can see that this kind of like uh, divvies up the space more or less correctly. The 87 here, so one of uh, these points here, this is a misclassification. So the value 87 tells us that I think it's about four different uh, points were misclassified. I think this as well might be one of them. And this one as well. Anyways, so it seems like most of our misclassifications are with respect to uh, the red data points. And then we can look at linear SVMs. And so when we're comparing between these two, you can see that there's a major difference between uh, the kernel being used. So by considering a linear model on this nonlinear data, um, we only achieve on the test set 80% accuracy. Whereas um, when we consider a radial basis function where it's an inherently nonlinear, you can tell that um, the decision boundaries are based around kind of like clusters of the given points, right? It's highest confidence around um, large densities of those given points and then less confident around the others, right? And so, and then K-nearest neighbor, this one's always kind of interesting to look at. Every time you drop in a new point, it's trying to look at those uh, kind of most similar to, uh, or it looks at the neighbors to see what class they are and applies that label. When you partition space, you get this kind of like uh, jittery type of uh, phenomenon, but it, it does show that it's actually a pretty accurate model too. Yeah, KNN is pretty trippy. I agree, um, but it's, it's particularly interesting. Um, it's very kind of like data proximity reliant um, as opposed to like as an instance-based method, it's really like, it's just the data and that's it. There's no like modeling per se that's going on as opposed to these other ones where, you know, you're, you're learning um, features about these distributions from the data, right? And then you're, you're developing your model as a result of it. So again, that's uh, Moon's data set, circles, again, um, kind of something, something similar. We expect, you know, in this case, it's like, way worse than random, right? There's no way that you can linearly separate this uh, where we like randomly guessing whether it's one class or the other, we'd actually be uh, more correct than this logistic regression. So, so that's interesting to think about. Um, decision tree as well, I mean, you can tell, so all of these kind of lighter points here is doing, like it just so happens that in the way that we partition the data, we've left out this entire like swath of the circle. Um, so all of those were misclassified. Um, linear SVM, yeah, worse than random. Uh, you can 
Here, the uh, radial basis function actually does a pretty decent job as well. You can tell that anything that falls outside of the circle, it's quite confident it will in fact be, be red. So, so that seems to make sense. And then KNN, and yeah, trippy, trippy in some sense, but, um, but roughly correct. I mean, everything within here, it's relatively confident will be um, when added an, a new blue point and anything outside will be, will be red. Um, and now in the linearly separable cases, so here, now, if your data is perfectly linearly separable, we can have pretty high confidence that linear methods will in fact do really well. So our logistic regression divides the plane pretty perfectly, right? And then uh, decision trees as well perfectly separates the data. I mean, this would be a decision tree with basically like one rule, right? Again, it's... Um, yeah, so super canon is supervised learning. So supervised just means that we have um, the color, right? We have we have a label for it. So it's supervised learning in that if I'm given a new data point, I can look at the labels of those data points closest to me um, and, uh, and and classify accordingly. So it's it's supervised as long as there's there's labels. It's just what's known as instance based. So it's not learning a, um, it's not learning to divide the plane beyond how close any given point is uh, to other points of, of the same class. I hope that, that makes sense. So by doing this, does this help see which algorithm is best? Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So, so what's interesting, at least in this case, uh, this hadn't happened to me before, but you can see every single model did perfectly well on the linearly separable case. Um, and the noisy one, while well, we have, in this case, 97, 93, 87, 83, and 83. So, so yeah, the idea here is there's like a few kind of main takeaways, but one being if the problem is hard, um, you can expect all models to do poorly. If the problem is easy, you can expect all models to potentially uh, do very, very well. Um, but really it's like, it's more of a case of trying to fit the right model to the right type of data, right? If I know that my data when plotted looks like this, I know I should avoid anything linear like the plague because it'll do worse than random guessing. Decision trees can do decently well given enough data. Um, but again, uh, as like kind of like inherently linear methods, perhaps, um, your model has to be way more complex and large to like finely partition space it's kind of like creating a circle by drawing like tangent lines along the entire thing right like you're you're still always stuck with uh, a linear method at a basis here again linear is terrible but between um svms and knn both seem to do particularly well and like the uh, radial basis function in particular would be kind of like the go-to method if your data were distributed this way the other thing too uh and and so i guess uh these are kind of just like Looking across the models, like this row-wise interpretation, we'll see that, well, in this case, that was from older data. In the last time I ran it, the KNN was uh, actually perfect. In this case, the RBF, uh, SVM, is, is, seems to be the best. You kind of like draw these conclusions uh, as a result. And then you can also look column-wise. So we're looking at kind of um, in what cases is the logistic regression particularly good, like 77 accuracy, 37. Here it's perfect, but again, it's in the like linearly separable way. Uh, but if you transform the data into, okay, so, so the idea, so the question here um, being, what happens if we uh, cast it into higher dimensional space? I mean, if they all become linearly separable, we'd expect all models to be particularly good, right? In that case, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Like that's what this row is more or less telling us. If your data become linearly separable, it's almost like the machine learning element to this, like trying to like craft a model that, that works particularly well is, is trivialized, right? You can pick any one of these, you have the right set of parameters, hyperparameters tuned to it, you learn the model and you're off to the races. Like your job as a machine learning engineer to create your models is, is more or less done. A lot of the times, and, and that's kind of, uh, I guess, like foreshadowing to your future work in machine learning, you'll, I, like I kid you not, you'll spend 90% of your time just making sure your data is good, it's the right kind of data, that it's representative of the problem. 
maybe 10% of it goes into kind of like tweaking models and these types of things. But um, really the, the concept that like, if you have garbage data going in, you're going to have a garbage model as a result. So really the, the data cleaning is, is what's particularly important. Um, but it's also fun. I mean, like to toy around with different models and to, and to have a good sense for how uh, the model that you choose fits uh, the data that you have, um, I think is like the, the main takeaway. Yeah, we really flew through this. So I guess uh, we won't have much time for the uh, other tutorial. Um, I do want to just like end on these kind of like takeaways though. Uh, and I would also recommend everybody to um, take the time to actually go through this one a bit more clearly, Li like quite literally on the topic of data cleaning. That's what a lot of these initial um, cells do and it explains it particularly well. Um, what I do want to close out though on here, um, take a look at the takeaway message or kind of like the key points um, from this tutorial. The other thing I, I might start doing a bit more is uh, is just kind of like leaving this uh, open to anybody who, who's like particularly curious or cares um, to kind of like dig into these things further. I haven't actually done this work uh, myself, but it's the kind of thing that I think for those who are, want to be more in the like research direction, these are the types of like questions and things you should be thinking about when developing your model. So if I want to know uh, for each data set, which one of the models will uh, produce a statistically significant improvement over the other, um, one thing we can do is perform bootstrap experiments. So like repeatedly generating the data, repeatedly resplitting re it, retraining each model, evaluating it, recording the accuracy, um, if we do this, we'd get like 20 new accuracies each round. Something you could perhaps do is plot these on like violin plots or like a box plot um, to see if, uh, if they're you know, more or less distributed in the same way. Um, figure out which type of statistical significance test you would use on uh, those data. Why would you choose one or the other? Um, and then draw conclusions. Can you stay can you state that for any one of the, the data sets, is there any one model that is in fact statistically significantly improving in performance over the others? Um, are any of them faster or slower? Um, what happens, so these are just like other things you might consider. What happens when you modify hyperparameters? Like are there ways that you could tweak these things to get a model that will perform particularly well in all instances? What if you, so in the data generation step, what happens when you increase the size of the data set? What happens when you decrease the size in the data set? Um, if we're timing this at all, I would suggest removing the plotting function because that's just like extra overhead. But, but yeah, the idea here is just to kind of like think about all these facets of the problem. And if your boss ever asks you, I need the best model and I need you to prove to me or at least uh, justify why one is, uh, is so much better than the other, this is kind of the, the thinking that you guys should, uh, should move in the direction of. So again, if, if anybody pursues this or um, it's like you're not getting any grades for this, but again, uh, in the pursuit of knowledge, this might be something kind of fun to think about. Um, and yeah, I'd encourage you to just like reach out uh, and share your results with me. Um, maybe if anybody does, can kind of like look through some of that stuff at the start of next tutorial. And I guess that kind of wraps up the time that we have for today. Sorry for going slightly over. Um, does anyone have any kind of like outgoing questions? Uh, great tutorial, very clear, instructive, awesome. I'll make sure that the updated versions of the slides, because I, I modified a few quick things, um, are going to be on uh, in the, the, the GitHub repo. And then other than that, I'll see you guys in next Friday. And done.